everybody has said, oh, Dalton's got no history. So I thought, well, let's find out. What we know is the town hall has always been important. It was built as a market hall. It's very much a focal point of the town. The actual building was rebuilt in 1856, and the stairs on the outside, uh, the ornamental ones, were added in 1927. Uh, and it's been a very useful building. It's gone from being uh, a magistrate's court, a market hall, to a theatre, uh, as we use it today for every, everything you can imagine. I'm Richard Luckett. I lived near Lynmouth. 30 years ago we had a farm just outside Darverton and we took part in a show called West Wild West. Yep, this is where it all happened 30 years ago. The West Wild West show. Uh, that was a music hall. We ran musicals to raise money for the town hall. Most of the shows were done on a theme. It started out with, with the horses and then people saying, well, of course, there's lots of songs to do with the Wild West. Why not? I think that was the best of all our shows. Um, and that was where that uh, chappy um, uh, threw the rope, wasn't it? And uh, did all the rope throwing. He's around still, I think, the bloke, isn't he? Oh, Hank, yes. I worked at Tantivy at the time, and he, he used to come in on his horse to do all his shopping and things like that. I'd usually give him my list at the shop, and the lady would pop inside and get it all ready, and then she'd bring it out. We didn't have to dismount. The horse used to get a few carrots and bits and pieces. Um, we'd pack it in the saddlebags and go back home again. I got talking to him one day and he said that he could do these rope tricks and asked if we'd all like to go up to his ranch, as he called it, because he had a, a slight American accent at the time. I don't know whether it was put on or not, but anyway, it impressed me. And we got him into the show just doing the um, lassoing. He did a marvellous act, uh, you know, the, the usual sort of rope business on the stage. There he is. Oh, oh, there he is. Look. Oh, yes. Yes. Was his real name? Richard. Richard something, Richard. wasn't it? Richard. I only knew his name. It was just Hank, wasn't it? You know? In his hat. Mm -hmm. I couldn't put a Richard or anything else to him, just Hank. And everybody got to call him Hank in the end. I suppose because of him being sort of American, he looked American, it's just one of those things that stuck. He 
was clever though, wasn't he? Oh, was right. Very clever. Well, at that particular time, I was mainly uh, to do with the choreography. I actually did do the Cam Cam. The bar at the back of the hall, which they never usually had, that was open. It was like a, a saloon bar on stage with cowboys and uh, dancing girls. And the beer was flowing free all night. We, I think we got more men that night, actually, to, <laughs> to the show than we normally did. We had Indians, cowboys, we saw some rifles even coming around the place. We all dressed as characters from the Wild West. We had Mexicans and some of them were serving. Wild women wandering around the place. So yes, everybody, everybody really took, took part. I was a tarty barmaid. Always wanted to be one and that's the only time I was one. That was terrific. I was wearing a very low leotard and pulling it down off my shoulders to show as much cleavage as possible. And you wouldn't believe how much money went into that cleavage that night. I'd done very well as tips. The show was such a success. We've got such talent. They're all grown up now and uh, married, children and grandchildren but it really was a terrific, colourful show. August 1952. I was on my way home from Switzerland. Um, I knew nothing about it until I arrived at Paddington Station. In those days, of course, the man took the, tick, took, took the ticket and punched it. He took the ticket, punched it, looked at it, and he said, oh, going to Dalverton. He said, that's washed away. Washed away, bloody nonsense, you know. <coughs> we'll see, see what happened when we get home. <laughs> We could see there's a lot of water about, but we got just outside, just coming up to the bridge, and a host of people met us, including policemen and firemen and so forth, and said, get over quickly, get home, move everything up, to up, up. Uh, the river's coming over. There was this, they had a warning that the water was coming down like a tidal wave from Willypool. And, uh, of course, they tried to get ready for it, but it was just a tremendous wall of water coming down. I couldn't believe that so much water could just come down a street like that. I just didn't know what had happened till I got to the bridge. This plaque behind me is supposed to be the level at which the water rose in 1952 floods. And in fact, I have it on very good authority that it was in fact 18 inches above that level. I don't think anybody was um, actually killed in our flood. Fortunately, we lost no people, just property, really. Oh, it was awful, dreadful when I think of it, because there was a milk bar washed right away. You see some cottages behind me on the other side of the bridge there. Well, there were two others there. The first one was a cottage that was being used as the Golden Guernsey milk bar. Great place for having teas and for youngsters to going to. The other one had to be pulled down because it was so badly damaged as well.
Some of the stones you can see behind me, which I expect weigh half a ton, were washed down about a quarter of a mile down the field. In the meantime, they put up a, a footbridge. I used to work on the Somerset County Council and uh, we used to do all the highways, but some of our jobs were to repair tar steps. And we've had to put the chains around the stones and lift them back. And they were all numbered. I say we had knew how to put them back. When this flood came, we had a cargo of bananas come all the way from Jamaica to help people, you know. And we were all allowed to go down to a place called Exmoor House and collect as many bananas really as you wanted. And although it was only for the people of Dulverton, as I can remember lots of people who didn't actually live in Dulverton come along and queue up with the rest of the people and take, you know, what was given. And they weren't entitled to it, but then there wasn't anything very much you can do about that. Well, for a few days, we did nothing but sell Wellingtons and Max and sell Westers and anything that was possibly waterproof. There was always somebody on hand to knock at the door and say, are you all right, and things like that. They just couldn't do more. Nobody went short of anything. Everybody had something to lend, you know, or give, but the spirit was absolutely terrific. In the 1960s, uh, the County Council ran these evening classes, and, and one was a course on photography. Then from that we formed the Camera Club, and we were interested in cine. He said, well, perhaps we could make a film on Delverton. This was in the 70s. It was to get a snapshot of the people working there and life in the town at that time. The whole vision of, of the film looked as though it was, it was all an idyllic life, uh, but certainly at the weekends, in the evenings, night time, it was different altogether. It was the Wild West. Uh, there were fights in the street and there was total mayhem. Uh, I think that's changed now to a certain degree and probably because they see that sort of thing happening on TV, they don't have to do it themselves. The film Ard Olverton was at the cusp of the change between Victorian times and modern times. I think that there was, there'd been a gradual change up until then and change has gathered pace since. The shops have changed, haven't they? It's when you go further out of the yeah, town, as you're going towards the school, mm. all that's grown There's up. A, but the centre is basically the same. same. In Dulverton, lots of things have changed, but it's very interesting that some of the shops have kept the original names of the places of bygone years. Crispin's was one of the antiques in 1970s, probably earlier than that as well, but they gradually changed character and they became um, a very nice little restaurant run by the same people who had the antiques, but they dabbled with antiques and restaurants at the same time. And then they retired and they were bought out and it continued, not as an antique, but as a restaurant. And it's gone on, it's changed hands again two or three times from the 70s. And it's still known as Crispin's. It still has the penny farthing outside on the wall. And it's still in the same little place. Like the chemist shop has always been called Profits, I and mean, Profits used to have it when we came here. It's changed hands twice and it's still Profits. People know it's Profits, and if you say, oh, go down to Profits, you know, they know very well you've got to go down to the chemist. And it's lovely to think that they've kept all these names going, you know, from years ago. People still refer to even the bakers, which is 
Balsams, which isn't Balsams at all, it's the Dolberton Bakery, but Balsams are the name of the people who used to run it up until 10, 12 years ago, I suppose. I can smell that now. <laughs> we, we used to go in the morning and get the rolls, put the money in through the window, and, then, and Reg used to pass out the, the hot rolls yeah. for our breakfast. And then the <laughs> buns, the buns just that weren't the sold at the end of the day, yeah. Marge would open up our front door and put in this big bag of buns oh, on, the, so on the hall exciting. stand. The people went to all the shops, so really they catered very well. But I suppose nowadays it's all done on a much bigger scale, which is why we've only got the one bakery here. And it was very much personal service. And then as, as it developed and, and the, 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 the bigger grocer, the smaller one closed and the bigger one uh, got taken over and that got taken over and it became a supermarket. And, and then you help yourself and the service went. Over the centuries, right up until the railway came, we were very tight-knit, self uh, contained community, we had to be, we were isolated. So they produced everything here from over the centuries, from leather, wool, butter, milk, butchery, everything you can think of was produced here. We do have, um, I think, a very good range of services considering the size of the town. And one of the biggest employers, or probably is, well, apart from the National Park Authority, is, is the laundry. They rely on the tourist industry doing hotel work um, and I, I guess they've got 40, 45 people working down there. We didn't have a garden. It was very difficult to um, dry clothes, mm. wasn't it, true? Mm. So um, all the big things I used to send mm. here. We, we tried to show the whole process from the time the clothes went in right through the whole process of washing it. All this machinery, folding sheets and things, and, and how everything was labelled and marked and invisibly marked, and then all, all bundled up into parcels. Used to go and off we in a had brown paper sorry. parcel, didn't you? Yeah, that's oh, right. Yes. It was all wrapped up so beautifully mm. as well. All folded. Right. Yeah. Sent down shoots. It was quite a fascinating thing. There is, a, there still was, I think, then a, a, a dry cleaning department, and there is now. Now they can't get enough local people to work for them, so they actually have to import the labour. So the van drivers, who are covering a lot of the West Country, um, many of them don't come from Dolberton anymore. But they drive around the vans with Dolberton laundry plaster all over them, so we're known everywhere. I think we had some sheets done once or twice there, but nothing um, after that. Shortly after the film, several died. Uh, Stan Ayres, who worked in the laundry, and also played the piano for the Wild West show. He died. Old Mr. Yerbury, uh, making the shoes. We just managed to catch him in time. That was quite fascinating, because he could make shoes to order. I drew a pair of sandals once, and he made them for me. Really? <laughs> yes, he did. Oh. Well, we had a dairy called Fisher's Dairy and they had lots of lovely cows and they had the right of way to come from the cow sheds all through the town down to the fields. That went on for years and years and you know people used to come to Dulverton just to see those cows coming down. It was such a lovely sight. Uh, John Arnold was one with the cows which meant the end of the cows which was rather sad really as that was a tourist attraction. Somebody came up with the idea of having perhaps a museum or a heritage centre, and we liked the idea of the heritage centre rather than the museum. 
Well, the Heritage Centre is run by Brenda Massey. She's done absolutely wonders building it up into what it is today. If you do anything in a town like Dalverton, then you, you're going to get opposition. Some people thought, oh, no, we don't want that. Why should we tell people about Dalverton? We know. They'll say it's a waste of money or something. Uh, that, that's usually what comes up. Well, it's, it's ratepayers' money being spent. I think it's important because it's a benefit of future generations. It is a source of, of preserving the past. And of course, it's a great help for tourism. I think the tourists have brought a lot of money into the town. Without the tourists, it would be a very poor little town. We rely on tourism now to sustain the economy. So without the tourists, the locals really aren't going to get the services that they do get in Dolverton. We decided last year to make a millennium film of the events in Dolverton during the millennium year. Is another snapshot. Yeah, yes, it, it 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 is. It's fascinating to look back, and see what happened nearly 25 years ago. This is what I feel with our Dolphin film and the Millennium film. Not a great deal of interest now, but in 50 years' time, a lot of interest. Um, people will be fascinated by it. Twisting me right. 